Welcome to the Coach's Table Podcast, where coaches come to grow personally and professionally through real-world application and online education. What is going on, everybody? Uh, what a beautiful day. Man, football's flying. Can't believe that we're already a couple weeks into the season. It moves. It moves really fast. Welcome to college athletics. Um, it's crazy. Once you kind of hit the, the summer, everything just starts to fly by as fast as possible. And you look up, and then it's Christmas time, and then the season's over. So it's pretty crazy. But, um, guys, hey, real quick, here's the deal. If you like what we are putting out, just a huge favor, share the show. Okay, that's my only ask for you. That's my only uh, request for you. Do us a huge favor, share the show. The full-length episodes are on YouTube. Okay, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube yet, then go ahead and do that as well. And then the other thing, do us a huge favor, leave a review. Okay, the review is probably the most important thing, and here's why. It lets other people know that this is worth their time. So if you would on Spotify, it takes 10 seconds of your life. Do us a huge favor. Leave a review. Um, I would appreciate that very much. And other coaches too, because that's telling them that it's worth their time for them to get better. And hopefully they get a nugget or two in order for them to get better. So um, if you guys would, I would appreciate that very much. I'm super excited for this conversation today. Um, we've been having a fantastic conversation off air. I think um, what's crazy because all the conversations that happen off air are really, really, really good. And so um, I'm super excited for what we have for you today. So without further ado, SMU men's basketball director, Vinny Kalati. What's going on, my man? What's going on, boss? How we doing? Man, I'm doing great. You, dog? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just making it work, right? Yeah, man. Hey, so like for everybody that obviously didn't hear any of our conversation beforehand, but um, let's just kind of pick up where we left off because I thought it was, it was fantastic. Um, you've been around – basketball for a long time right you've had stops at georgia state smu boston and a couple other places as well um and which is awesome and so where we were kind of at is you know working with head coaches at least understanding what they want and, and from the standpoint of the athletes and coming back essentially off of an extended break and talking about how things are subjective and objectively based and one thing that you mentioned I thought was great was that, you know, baseball has done a great job of becoming very objectively based and basketball is still kind of, you know, behind the times from that standpoint, we're still very subjectively based. We're still very much like, I think this, I think that. And it's like, well, we have the information, the technology to um, objectify this stuff. Like, why are we not doing that as much? Kind of what are your thoughts on that? And why isn't it, you know, kind of moving as fast as some of the other sports? You know, I, Basketball has always been kind of a this is how we used to do it mm. uh, type of deal. Um, and for a lot of things, you know, people are successful in what they do and how they do it. So when you get the opportunity to have the technology, I think a lot of times we see the information, we understand it. Sometimes it gets lost in translation when you're speaking to your head coaches. Um, mm. You know, we tend to talk to head coaches as if they're a strength coach, a performance coach, a therapist, a, a, a athletic trainer, and sometimes it doesn't always work. So it's really just trying to find a couple numbers that you can say, okay, this is it. This gives us a good amount of information. This is what it's telling us. For the most part, they really just want to say, okay, was this intense enough? Was it not? Uh, and I think at the end of the day, man, no, it's their program and it's our jobs to always find a way to increase our workload capacity the way that we have to so that they can sustain what's going on. Uh, college basketball, you know, at the, I'll speak more for the division one level. I don't think it's really that much different throughout the divisions, but you know, we do have the shortest off season of any division one sport. Yeah. So you're going to have a lot of time with them and you have to be able to manage it the right way. And, you know, if a coach wants A, then you got to give him A. Whether or not you agree with it or not, that's just what it is. As long as we're not doing harm to these young men and women, we can train them in a way that's going to get the, the response that the coach is looking for. And then it's our job just to continue that path and move forward and always have a good relationship. Because, I mean, you can't always be competitive. You got to pick your spots. You got you to pick your battles. And I think that was one thing early on in my career that was – you know, I'm always and early in my career. I'm like, you know, we got to do this. We got to do that. You know, from a sports yeah. performance standpoint, it's like, well, we're not the strength and conditioning team. We're a basketball program. We're a soccer program. We're baseball, you know, whichever program you are. And 
you got to get them ready for what your head coach wants. And it's, I think the other part that is really important, but sometimes hard to find is matching what your beliefs are with an individual that you want to work for. And I've been fortunate enough to work with my current head coach going on year four and Mm -hmm. our beliefs and how we do things, how we want to accomplish things are very, they're aligned. And I'm not always having to be like, okay, we're doing too much of this. We're doing too much here. I'm lucky enough that we have some technologies. We got force play data. We have connects on, uh, I don't always have to go with them with connection and say, Hey, the sheet says blah, blah, blah. We have really good dialogue daily to know that, okay, if coach knows, you know, we stepped on the gas a little bit, a lot, these last uh, couple days, we need to back off or hey, coach today's a good day. Let's jump them. Yeah. But again, at the same time, there are going to be instances that we're going to have to, that we might have to go off script because coaches have to teach. They have to find ways to get these young men and women to understand schemes, plays, and all that. So it is our job to just increase that capacity as best we can and get the coaches to really have trust in us so that we can do that. Because without that, then, yeah, you're going to have issues going back and forth. So it's really that communication piece and being able that you're aligned with someone who has similar beliefs. And how have you kind of like throughout your years developed that relationship with them? I know time is such a massive factor, but like for somebody that let's say they just got to a new spot, they don't know the head coach that well, maybe they don't know the staff or, or maybe they know one guy or two, like how did you kind of start to develop that relationship and that trust with, you know, a coach before you started making recommendations or did you start making them right mm-hmm. away? Cause I think a lot of people find themselves in that, like, Oh, I know everything, or at least I know a lot. So like, why aren't they listening to me? Why aren't they doing mm-hmm. this? How did you kind of maneuver that throughout your time earlier? And then how do you see it being different now? I mean, earlier when I first started, it was, I was a young, I mean, I was 23 when I got my yeah. first division one job. Yeah. And I got blessed enough that, uh, you know, I got to work at Boston university and coach Glenn Harris and then coach Joe Jones, who was our basketball coach, gave me my first shot. But I definitely was hard headed because it was like, man, I'm, you know, this is what we're supposed to do conditioning wise. <laughs> this is the energy system development. And it's like, wait a minute, yeah, yeah. you're setting your program. This is how we need to get it done. And at first it's hard because when you're young and I've had this conversation with, with GAs, yeah, they're t- they, they want things done, but they might not always know how to do it because they're just, they're, they didn't research what, what we did. They didn't go to school for what, for what we did. So it's our job to relay that information as best we can. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if they don't want to accept it, then they don't accept it and you move on. And when you do it from the jump without building that relationship, it can be almost, I want to say territorial, but Mm -hmm. it's almost like, wait a minute, I've been the coach of this program for a while. You're coming in here day one, telling me what to do. And yes, we've built a relationship through the interview process, but you still got to kind of compound that thing uh yeah honestly with 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 my current head coach coach Lanier man he was there was a lot of vetting being done just for me to get the position whether it was his previous strength coach who I was who who I know in the field to other coaches that I've worked for that he knows so he got a good understanding of who I was um and I think the type of personality of what that that I am it worked well with what he was trying to accomplish and the environment he was trying to bring. Um, mm. When it came to the flip side of, okay, do I just jump in? I think that took over the course of years being in this field to know that when I went to him day one, it was like, all right, I need to see how his, pra- how his practices are like. Because I do think a, a lost art in us with basketball is you have the ability to watch a lot of games and watch a lot of films. So if I'm, interviewing with a coach, I should know their coaching style. I should mm-hmm. know if they're a run and gun team. I should know if they're defensive mind and they want the games in the fifties. Like you should have an understanding of what that coach is looking for. And then you got to take time, ask questions, uh, what they're, what, what, what kind of program they're, they're trying to run schemes, things like things of that nature so that, you know, He's going to be a conditioning based coach. Okay. That's got to be a priority. We got to get stronger. Yeah. We got to get more explosive, but conditioning is important to my head coach. So we got to condition him. Um, 
if he's not every every coach loves conditioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. coaches some coaches just wanted a little more because of how they play. For us, sure. conditioning is important. We've been able to knock on one. We were really durable last year. We had a ninety nine percent participation rate. Um, we only had two guys miss games. Both were due to non contact. So that's going to hopefully that repeats itself and we, we kind of do everything that, that we need to do in, in the weight room strength wise, durability wise to continue that, that trend. But conditioning for us needed to be up. You know, mm-hmm. we like to play full court defense. We like to not so much press, but just pressure the ball. So yeah. that is going to take a lot out of you. Like we're doing that to make our player who's bringing up the ball We're we're doing that to make the guard tired, but it's going to make us tired too. So right. conditioning, it, it it has to be a component. We also like to play fast, which I do think it's always funny. Our coach says it all the time. Um, everybody wants to come to college and play fast. Everybody does. Every kid wants to just go, be in transition. Yeah. But you don't actually really want to run. Like mm. you don't actually really want to run because in college to play fast, a lot that goes into it. You got to make decisions really fast. They got to be calculated, and you got to be in good shape. So you, you tell a head coach, fast too. Yeah, you, you tell a head ball. coach. You tell a head coach, I want to play fast. I want to play well. You know, you're gonna get what you're asking for because we're gonna play mm-hmm. fast, but we got to be in good shape. So right. knowing that that's how my head coach is, those are there's there are things that I need to do to make sure that the quality of what our players are putting out, we're getting there. He knows. It's not going to be perfect day one and probably not going to be perfect day 10. But by the right. time the ball goes in the air, we've done enough uh, development and we've gotten enough adaptation to elicit the responses that we need to know that, okay, we're able to execute the plan that he, that, that he has put in place. So yeah. it's really getting to understand and know how your head coach likes to coach, what he likes to do scheme wise. And that's got to be just as important for you as it is for him. And I think that's where we get lost because when you're young, you think you know everything. Just like we hate when people say it to us when we're young. We do. We think we know everything. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. these coaches are smart. They know what they're doing. They might not have the best information about what we do, but mm-hmm. it's our job to either it's our job to either convince them to do this is, you know, do it, do it this way, or we got to get the responses needed so that he can continue to do what, what he wants. So it's really taking, it's, they're going to always do their homework on you. They're going to talk to your, to your references. They're going to, you know, peel the layers to find out who you are. It's your job to do the same. Find out who yes. he is as a coach, who she is as a coach. How do they treat their staff? How do they treat their players? And then, okay, that aligns with me. I agree with how, they 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 do things okay basketball wise how does he or she coach their team they do it this way okay i know on day one this is what i gotta be prepared for i gotta make sure that he gets what he needs for game one or she gets what she needs for game one so we have to do our homework and i think sometimes that part of it slips through the cracks because we're so concerned with being objective which you still have to be but you do have to give the head coach, the leader of the program, what they want because it's their program. We are working alongside them, but they're the ones that have to kind of make that shit go. Facts. And like when you think about it, like if you think of something so simple, like, okay, you're going to reverse engineer, you know, everybody says for the sport, which yes, you're going to, but also like for your practice too, right? And so, you know, it's like, how are you, how do you practice? Right, which is the style of the play of typically the the head coach or the assistant coaches or you know the associate depends on all that stuff. But it's like, you know, when you think about it, when you break it down, it's like, okay, well, like yes, that's what they need to be prepared for. That they need to be prepared for that style. So like my energy system development, my conditioning should therefore reflect, you know, mm-hmm. whatever that may be. Hopefully, right? Like that's what. And then obviously, oh, again, yeah. the games, the game's the number one KPI, right? But the style of the game, how y'all play basketball compared compared to how we play, is different. Right. So like my guys might, you know, are going to be prepared differently from that standpoint, just do the style of play. It's different. It's not the style of play that our coach wants. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's crazy because to us, it's like such common sense, but, um, 
to people that are younger. And, and from that standpoint, it's like, it's not even something that they think about, um, which is very interesting. But so, okay. So you've recently said, or at least put something out on um, LinkedIn, which I thought was really interesting. And I'm battling with this. And I think everybody else is battling with this too, but the information overload from, you know, you have GPS units, you have four stacks, you have VBT, you have daily wellness questionnaires, you have, you know, whatever else you got going on, Nord boards or, or, or all this other stuff. How do you kind of take all that information, simplify it and say, these are the six, five things that we're looking at because there's, I mean, you get a jump on, on a, on a four stack and you can get up to like 200 metrics, which is a ton, right? I mean, you're not mm-hmm. looking at all 200 of that, right? Um, some of these other GPS units, you can get over a hundred metrics per person in a practice. You're like, that's a ton of, you know, it's like you can accumulate a ton of data really fast and that's cool and all, but like a lot of that is noise. And a lot of that is like not actionable or it's like, Hey, if I need to look at something that's there, but you know, you're not using all of that. How do you kind no. of go no. through that process? Uh, so I'll start with saying this before you get into anything force plate related, all that. I think we forget that our jobs as sports performance coaches is to increase performance. Crazy. And I've said this when I've, when I've, it's, it's, it's nuts. It's, it's wild because it's like <laughs> people talk about all these metrics and being sports scientists and this and that. Mm. And I don't care what level you are, whether you're high school, whether you're college, whether you're pro, your job is not to maintain. Your job is to get somebody better. Now, that might be in a course of a year, the table turned. Where in season, you're in in college, you played 32 games. Maybe your gains, right, aren't as steep because obviously the weight room does take a back seat because like we said before before we started, we are such a tactical, skill-oriented sport. It's not like Mm -hmm. track and field. You have – a ball, you need to dribble, pass, shoot. Like there's a lot of things that go into it. So your ability to get somebody better in season might be one, five, ten percent better. But you better get one, five, or ten percent better as many days as possible. You know, sometimes it does take having a foot off the gas to recover. That could get them better. That is necessary sometimes. That 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 definitely needs to happen. But I think a lot of times when we get in season, and then I don't, I'm only going to speak for basketball, but I do think it's across a lot of sports, we maintain. That's not, mm-hmm. what, that's not what we're supposed to do. We are, mm-hmm. Our job is to increase performance. When we talk about what teams do really well late in the year is they get better little by little during the season. That might be 1% better every day, but if that's – 1% better every day. They got something better every single day. That wasn't – they did a they did a maintenance block. You don't need to do all that. Um, yep. The other part is we've got to know how to train people. And I think – This episode is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder is the number one performance platform for strength coaches around the world. Their software provides coaches with an elevated experience when it comes to program development, data tracking, and staying connected with athletes and clients. Coaches also have access to consultations with Team Builder's in-house sports scientists to help manage and analyze data. Head to teambuilder.com and sign up with promo code TABLE to start your free 30-day trial. That is teambuilder, T-E-A-M-B-U-I-L-D-R.com and sign up with promo code TABLE to start your free 30-day trial. Coaches, this podcast is sponsored by Samsung Equipment. They have been providing elite strength training equipment and professional weight room solutions since 1976. If you value product quality, great customer service, and a company with integrity, make Samson Equipment your go-to. Visit them at samsonequipment.com and let them know the Coach's Table podcast gave you a seat at their table. That is Samson Equipment, S A M. S O N equipment.com and let them know the coaches table podcast gave you a seat at their table. This also goes into when we talk about uh, technology is we don't know what we don't know. And I think sometimes as coaches, 
we determine ourselves to be a guy, a poliquin guy, a conjugate guy, a this guy. And it's like, that's not the only way of training. My opinion, everybody is a little bit different. You should not be married to a philosophy. You should be married to the outcome. If I need to train X person a little bit differently than XB, even though they have the same quote unquote goals, that doesn't necessarily mean that I can use the same performance to elicit the, the, the response that I need. Someone might need to go a little bit differently. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they're a novice as opposed to someone who's intermediate. Maybe they have some issues movement mechanic wise that you can still get somebody better, but maybe you have to do a different exercise. Like there are a million ways to do things. And I think a lot of times, we get married to these philosophies instead of getting married to the outcomes and we ignore things when we actually don't even know if it would help. Like I, I, for me, like my, my biggest kind of like <laughs> aha yeah. moment was, you know, when I started in the fields, everything I learned about was, um, you know, FMS and great cook and all that. And it's great yeah. stuff. And I still use a decent amount of it, mm -hmm. but I never did Gary gray work. I never did the, the, the 3D lunges, the transformational lunges, I never did it. And it wasn't, and I always kind of, kind of shunned it away, but it's because sure. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the purpose. I didn't understand what it was. I saw a couple things. It didn't make sense to me. So I was like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And instead of going to a clinic, an online clinic for COVID, I did a Gary Gray course. I liked it because it started, there was some things in there that I didn't agree with. But there were some things that I was like, you know what? I, I can utilize that can get some that will if I get this on, if, if I add this to my program, that'll get somebody better. And I did another mm -hmm. course. And then I, you know, went off the map and I started doing something else. And you know, you go into uh de uh deficit training that, that coach Karen that coach Karen talks about. You start going into conjugate, you find ways like there is a lot of ways you can utilize different modalities to elicit the response. It's just, mm -hmm. is that modality good or is that modality going to elicit the best response for that person? If it's a yes, then you do it. If it's a no, then you need to find another, uh, another modality to use. And I think sometimes if we just get stuck into doing the same thing with everybody, yeah. if you, like for us, we have 15 guys, if three or four guys get ridiculously better, but the other 10 or 10 or 11 guys don't and we're on the same program or they got a little bit better. I'm doing them a disservice because if I had just given them a different philosophy, maybe they would have responded better. Right. And I think that's part of the thing is making sure that we kind of fill as many buckets as we can when it comes to training and really understand what gets people better. Not just, I like this person's philosophy and I'm not telling people not to have a philosophy. You definitely need to right. have your go-to. But yeah, you should sure. learn about other things because there's a lot, you know, the whole, there's a million ways to skin a cat is one way to say it. I just think there's a lot of things that you can put together and create a philosophy that is really good. And I think that's what I've done is I've kind of combined yeah. with things that I've learned when I was with Coach Boyle to Paula Quinn to a little, to, to a conjugate style to AFS. Like I've created a different way that I think our guys have done a great job. And, you know, I, I have, we have the force plate data to show people who have gotten better from June 1st to March 15th. And when the season ended from November 6th, from the first game to the end of the season, their verticals still went up Their time to take off went down. Like they got better in season. And that's more right. than just a couple cases. So having a diversified portfolio for your strength work, is key to becoming a really good coach. And I, I think to being a really good coach and a free plug I'll give is Mladen's Agile Periodization book. I think that's one of the best books out there. If you haven't yeah. read it, I think it's phenomenal. Yep. I think it touches on everything and he kind of goes into that detail. But when it comes to technology, uh, when we get back to that, it's what are you going to use if you're not going to use it, then there's no point in tracking it. If it's not going to give you information, there's no point in tracking it. You're just doing it just to do it. Connect the, for, for us, the, the, uh, 
connects on. I utilize it for myself so I know what's going on, our training load. I don't always tell our coach, hey, coach, this is what I need you to do. Do this because, again, it's his program. What I do do is when I see the trend from last year to this year and I know, okay, game days are going to elicit this response. So after a while, we've practiced. I've got some data points. I can now go to coach and say, all right, this is what we're looking for. These are the days where we did these drills and it gave us this response. Yep. I'm not saying you have to do this exact day, but I'm saying this is a perfect day for a high day. This is a perfect day for a low day. This is the blueprint that you used on both days. You don't have to use the same plan, but this is how we did it. This is how you ran it. That's more of how I use my connect sound when it, when it comes to relaying the intensities for our coach because he has to make the practice plan. He's the sport coach. He knows how to win the games. It's my job to do human performance, but he has to plan it the way that he sees fit so that they learn, they understand the schemes. The key well, and like, I, and like, like when we were talking about like getting deep into March and like making runs is like that to me and, and maybe to you as well, that information of the differentiation between what a high day, low day, what a drill provides or what it, it does from a both mechanical load, from a central nervous system standpoint or from a recovery standpoint, right? Like, Hey coach, just as a heads up, these 10 drills are, you know, if we go red, yellow, green, these are our harder drills. They do the most mm -hmm. intense stuff. Um, doesn't mean we can't use them as a heads up, but just know like when we do put these in, if we are tired and we do too many of these, you know, that could be the reason why, right? Yeah, then here's our yellow could. ones, here's our green ones, just as a heads up. So then we can kind of marry some of this stuff up a little bit. And it's, so and it's our can, job to give them that catalog. Facts, exactly. But the problem is a lot of people aren't doing that. They just look at like total distance, which is great. And like, it's a metric. It's something that you need to look at, but it doesn't tell the whole picture either. And yeah. so like, if you only look at that one thing, I think you're missing the boat tremendously because if you aren't understanding like what the drill selections are, what, what, what you're doing consistently too, because it's no different than us training, like strength uh -huh. coaches, put your strength coach hat back on. If, 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 you know, the simple one, if I don't ever bench or I don't do any upper body horizontal push movements, right. And then I go and do bench. I'm like, why is my bench down? It's like, well, we, we haven't done that. Yeah. So like, why am I, why really am I overly sore? It's, you haven't <laughs> done that. <laughs> yeah. And like <laughs> it, it's no different. Right. Uh, and so, so it's, it's, it's just a different methodology. It's just a different right. attribute that you're trying to look at. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think like, so I haven't, I haven't used catapult in a while. What I pay yeah. attention to the most when it comes to Connexon is our rate of acceleration. Mm. When I see a significant decline after practice, that's when I know, hey, coach, we dropped almost almost 20% from yeah. our, for our acceleration. That's when it's like, hey, coach, our next day, we got to go down. That yeah, yeah. to me is a key metric because you're seeing, because that's what our sport is, acceleration, acceleration. Accel that's that's yeah. what it is. Uh, Connexon also does a change of direction count which yep. I use more, me and the trainer use more for uh, kind of seeing if we have anybody who pops up and says my Achilles or my knee, which knock on wood, we haven't had sure. any. Um, I can definitely go over some of the protocols that we do for that. But uh, yeah, that's, another met that's another one that we look into a lot because that just tells us, obviously that is gonna be very demanding on the body to change direction in excessive amount of times. But those are really the, the two ones from Connexon that I look at a lot a rate of acceleration, if we see a big decline, if we see that 15 plus percent decline, then we know fatigue is a factor. Yeah. We know fatigue is a factor. We know we need to be able to relay that information to our head coach and say, hey, and at times we need to have a hard day when we're tired. Mm -hmm. I think that gets, I, I think that can be a big error in, hey, we're tired, we need a lighter day. I think many times that is true, but I think sometimes, they need to be calculated. Yeah, we need to have a intense day when we are fatigued. It has to be calculated. You cannot do no harm, but I do think our bodies need to go through something with bat because of the sport of basketball because it is so skill savvy that doing something yeah. when you're tired does have significant benefits in our game because you know 
for us, it happened, you know, un, under a minute. Things can happen when you're tired. You have to be able to, you have to have been there before. You might, you might not be able to, uh, you know, give the same environment that's going on, a, a, a mm -hmm. screaming crowd, but you can yeah. still simulate what your body feels like having to do something to remember a play, to act, to execute a play, to know that if a coach says, Hey, this is what the opponent likes to do and you're in a timeout and he's telling you this is what's happening switch one through four you have to be able to handle that mentally when you're fatigued so i do think there are times that you need to have calculated sessions when a they're tired we can still push today it, mm -hmm. we don't need to go crazy and that is a trust factor but yep. we definitely do need those um from uh from from, a, from an encore standpoint yeah i agree with that because it's also like you get the mental aspect, but you know, like you're saying, the the skill acquisition or at least the continual skill component during a state of fatigue and a state of tiredness and a state of I don't want to be here or I don't want to do this at that level is yeah. grit gritty. I mean, I, I like that word a lot more than some of those, but it, it 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 it's gritty and it's challenging and it's a hopefully a example replica or or, or a future forecast of like what's to come. And I look at it no different than, you know, you have to expose them to maybe ranges of remote, extreme ranges of motion, yeah. just so to, to say, like, we've been there. So when it does occur at fast speeds, at whatever, you're not like, I've never been here before, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's and really that's important, what, like, too. So I heard this quote, and I don't want to butcher it, so I want to make sure I get it right. And it made so much sense. We do not raise to our level of competition. We sink to our level of consistencies. Mm. What we are doing over and over and over again, uh, that usually what is what happens when you're under the gun. Who you are as a person shows up when you're under the gun. If you act like one person, but then you're under fire and you your character changes, that's who you are because it's fight or flight. So when we're playing, what we are doing consistently is what's going to show up when we're tired, when we have to do things in a certain way. We're not going to just rise, oh, we're playing, we're, uh, we're, we're SMU and we're going to play the number one team in the country and we're going to do all these things that we've never done. <laughs> we've, we, yeah. we've uncharacteristic, never, we, uncharacteristic. Yeah. Does that happen? Yes, it happens. Once in a blue moon, it happens. But if you're sure. telling me, okay, uh, we're going to play the number one team in the country, and all of a sudden we're going to shoot 45% from three. We're going to shoot 52 from the floor, but our averages are 36 from three and 47 from, from, from the field. I'm banking on that happening more than us all of a sudden shooting the lights out. That, does, that doesn't mean that it can't happen for, for a team. But we are going to sink to our consistencies. That's who we're going to be more times than not. Out of 31 games, you got your regular season and then you got your guaranteed one postseason game. Out of those 32 games, more times than not, you are going to sink to your consistencies. You're going to have some variances, but that's what it's going to be for us. So yeah. Um, the other part is our force play data. So we do a couple things. Uh, we do jump mm -hmm. every day. Um, that's our oh, readiness wow. test. We take a look yep. at, yeah, I get lucky, man. Like I, I get coaches always like, how, how long do you need for a warm up? He'll joke around and say eight. I'll say 12. He'll be like, all right, cool. Go 12. Uh, <laughs> but, but we'll okay, get let me ask a jump second. Let me, let me ask yeah. this. One. How long does it take you to jump? Because you go in multiple groups, right? Because this is something that a lot of people run into. Uh -huh. How long does it take you to jump your guys every day? I would probably say, because um, I do it like during their lifts, it probably takes me, so we'll have like eight and eight. It'll probably take me like three minutes, three, 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 because okay. we'll do two jumps. Yep. Um, but we'll jump every day, and I don't always get to see the feedback right then and there. I usually, what I do is I'll, I'll go say, boom, go say, back. boom. Yeah, 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 and then yeah, I'll go yeah, back, yeah. whether it's during the session or, or, or um, whether it's during practice or after. But um, um, again, <clears> we're really looking for. Obviously, our vertical, just so we can see if there's, you know, a big drop off. Uh, but I'm really looking at left to right breaking. I'm really looking at left to right propulsion. And I'm really looking at um, um, 
takeoff time and our RSI. Uh, that's what I'm going to look at right after just to kind of see where their numbers are, how they're going fatigue yeah. wise. The other thing that I'll do is we will test this once every like five to seven weeks. And there's a couple that, that we do. So we will do a static jump and we'll compare the two. Yep. And what research has told us is that if your static jump and your counter movement jump have about one, per, uh, a one degree more than the other, that usually is what we can say is you got a healthy p- patella tendon. You're able to respond to the forces and you're good. If you are below that, if there is a deviation lower than that, more times than not, you will have patella tendinosis or an unhealthy patella that you might be asymptomatic, but something could pop up. Um, so we'll do that about once every five to seven weeks, unless we do have someone who has some patella going on, then we'll probably test it like once, uh, um, once a week ju- ju- just to kind of keep track of it. Uh, right. We also do every five to seven weeks, we will do a seated calf raise for our Achilles. And then we will do a belt mid five pull also. Uh, that one's going to be more for quad, uh, quad tendinosis. And sure. we do that every five to seven weeks with the mid thigh pull with the belt. We're looking at like two and a half or more times body weight for the formula where above yep. that we tend to have go to run the area for our seated calf. I believe it's like 1.4 to 2.0 off the top of my head. Uh, and that just tells us we don't have the money to do some of the screenings that some of the NBA teams do um, sure. some of those tendon screenings. So having those numbers gives us a decent, understanding of if we are at the end of this range or if we're prior to this range, then that's something that, that we need to look out for. Uh, for our protocols, we'll go into that. Uh, I got lucky enough to, you know, I have a really good relationship with, with the guy here with, with the Mavs. And, you know, we've talked a lot about some, some of these things, but we utilize a five by five protocol that he's developed and it's done. He it's done great work with 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 the Mavs. He's probably he's you know in my opinion one of the best strength coaches um, in the NBA. Just how he kind of structures his stuff and and the information that he has and he utilizes. Um, but we do a five by five protocol. Each rep is a five second ISO, and we mm-hmm. load up. You're talking two and a half, three times body weight. And we we'll do that on a leg press. Um, our alternatives are we'll put the weight all the way up on a leg extension so it doesn't move and we'll get into full flexion and we'll yep. do the same thing five by five, just like an overcoming ISO, which again ISO. will elicit a similar response. When we're in full yep. flexion, we're looking at quad tendon. When when, when we get that 45 degree, we're, we're looking at yep. tele. Patella. So those are our options. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And then for our calf raise, you know, I think it's again, like when we were, when I was younger, you know, calf raises were like, oh, those are, you know, oh, it's just calf raises. You don't need to do them. Um, and yeah. I think, I really think the last, I'd say five to 10 years, things really popped off and just how important they are to knee health, uh, foot, everything. So for our seated calf or our squat calf raises, anywhere from three to four sets of eight to 12 reps, mainly because the soleus is not an endurance muscle. So I treat it more like a, like, like, I'm in a um, hy- in a uh, hypertrophic range. Whereas if yeah. I'm going gastroc, standing mm-hmm. or single leg, we'll go 15 to 25 reps, and we'll go yeah. anywhere from two to four sets. Yeah. Um, but we'll do a seated calf raise on our force plate, not testing wise, but we'll do it once every four weeks, and then we'll actually legitimately test it every about five to seven, um, and that's just to kind of make sure that we're seeing that information so we can kind of track it a little bit. Um, sure. I don't really put, unless something kind of flashes out, I don't really put too much stock if I, if I add it in on week three or week four, but it's really that usually around week six or week seven is when I'll be like, okay, let's dissect it and let's look yeah. at it. And, um, yeah. It doesn't, your heel does not need to be off the ground a lot. I that was the first error that I had. You're talking about, you should be able to fit a piece of paper underneath your heel and that's it like it should not be up a lot so um i got a really good facilities team they let me drill into the floor so we anchored 
uh, a pin in, in yeah we anchored a pin into the floor in between our force blades and i got a i have a a bobo one the guys with the grizzlies do a great job me and eric worked work together years ago and then chris chase is a phenomenal coach but they actually like strap dudes in like they got anchors on each side like it's a seat belt so they can't move yeah that's cool that's what we need yeah yeah theirs is way better than mine but uh i'll sure, do sure, sure. a chain and i'll get a t-bar and i actually get two so rights they fit perfectly around the quads of our guys and okay. we'll put the bar over the so right so it's flat so they don't feel any pressure on on their knee um mm -hmm. and we'll go our seated calf raise that way as opposed uh, to using a pad because if you use a pad that foam could inhibit some of those scores so you're not going to see as much because the yep. so rights yep. are harder you're getting that um you're getting as close to a number as 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 you can so sure 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 that's um for those of you that that are new to data for stack testing understanding why the lower body is so important not just jumping but why the calves are so important for the achilles and for the knee go back rewind this five six seven eight times because what he just gave you was a very mini master class on why that stuff is super important and how you can utilize this stuff in a efficient manner to get the information that you want right i think everybody's like i think everybody's made the mistake i should say of Oh, it's just calves. Like it's not a big deal. And it's like, well, for basketball and for football, it's a really big deal, actually. You know, yeah. and you could use, you could pull all these examples, right? But they, they are as important. And I think like when we talk about low hanging fruits and we talk about, you know, big ROIs for low, um, um, hanging fruits, I think cat direct, direct calf work is a yes. massive, massive ROI for very little investment um from an energy standpoint from also the standpoint as well and it can help you protect your athletes and increase major their, yeah you know what i'm major, saying major major for yeah. something so minor for something so much like yes you need to be able to create force every you need to be strong you you you, you yep. definitely obviously need need to work that force velocity curve but you're for talking sure. about adding in calf raises tib raises things that are beneficial for your health knee health mm -hmm. ankle health achilles health doing big toe work like these are things that take less than three minutes that exactly. adding them into your, adding them into your program whether it's on the lift or having them come back i mean i don't know about anybody, but like our guys mm -hmm. we have a great culture i hate using that word we have a great environment <laughs> uh, yes environment yeah we have a great environment man our guys do a great job they're on the court a ton they'll they'll come back they shoot on their own they're always trying to find somebody to rebound for them they yeah. do a phenomenal job you know i'm definitely blessed to work with the guys that i work with they're really they care about their craft and i think you know we talked about the effect of social media i think some of that kind of got drawn out just because we i don't want to go too much into social media but obviously it portrays people in different lights. You don't see the full story. You see a snippet. And I yep. think our guys really care about getting themselves better. We have a lot yeah. of guys that really want to be pros. I think, you know, I, I do think the world of them, obviously things got to go in their way, but they work a ton on their game and they do what is necessary to take care of their bodies. So, if, so if I say, Hey man, you know, for us, our guys have to complete their protocol three times a week. Yeah. There is no adjustments. It's a, hey, I don't care how you do it. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, as long as it is not three days in a row and it's three days a week, as long as you get in that protocol, that's all I care about. So even yeah. if you don't want to put it into your lift and you just want to say, Hey man, you got study hall. We're in the same building as study hall. Boom. Come in five minutes done. One set, five reps, five seconds. One set is just under a minute. So, I mean, you can get five sets in in five minutes, and just go yeah, bang exactly. bang. That. It, it, well, that and like I like to do it um, at the beginning of my workouts too. And the reason why is is you know because it's a little bit more controlled. Um, the guys can focus a little bit too, and it helps with like a mental standpoint. Because let's be honest, sometimes they come in and they don't want to do anything at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so I give Big them for something. Power development. Huge for power development. Yeah, Big for power development. See the calf raises big for power development before any type of lower body 
um, compound movement, whether it's your strength, your, your deadlift, your, I'm sorry, your squat, your deadlift, anything. Big part of huge, it. Huge. Huge. And so I'll throw it in at the beginning um, with some ISOs as well. And, um, you know, typically they're feeling pretty good after that. You got a, a calf pump, you got some, some ISOs in the knees are feeling pretty good. That's not what I do always. But if, if it's like, hey, you know what? You guys, you know, we're focused, we're tired, we're, or we're lacking focus, we're tired. Let's do some very low level stuff, calf raises, right? And yeah. hold ISOs. And you know what? Then we'll get to our training. And, and it's worked out pretty good so far. I'm not saying that it's going to work out for everybody. It works out pretty good so far. Um, yeah. and so I can't complain, but I like to do it in the front too. Cause at the end, sometimes, you know, you, you tell it's us just fair. like you, when you do, you know, you do arm farm at the end, right? Sometimes it it's can just get like sloppy and quick. No, it can no get doubt. sloppy. Exactly. No and so I'm just like, no you doubt. know what, no let's throw this at the beginning. So, um, it, it, it I, I just think it's so important from, from, from that standpoint of, of it. Um, because I just think it's, it's just so critical. You look at sprinting and you look at, um, you know, Achilles injuries and hopefully nobody has one. But you look at Achilles injuries and, and what is it? Well, it's the heel is elevated most times. It's the shin is low to the ground most times. And what occurs is, you know, it's the pulling of the tendon, obviously. And then it, it just tears. It's mm -hmm. like, well, is it a lack of calf development? Yeah. Potentially, right? Potentially. I mean, the, and, the, and, and the soleus is what's going to give us our biggest bang for our buck. Facts, yeah. And because I think you're in that bench and it, knee yeah. position. Yeah. yeah. So. It's crazy, no, but no. anyway. So if you're not doing calf raises, um, I think you're really missing the boat on on a lot of things there, honestly. But that's just me. So welcome to yeah. to that. Um, okay, so something that's really interesting to, I think a lot of people. This has gained a lot more popularity. Curved running, I think, is more. I go back and forth. I think curved running is more important because it's literally sport. You hardly ever really get a true, you know, linear sprint. Now to work the mechanics and to, to increase mm -hmm. max velocity and capacity, you're going to do more linear, but curved running, especially in the game of basketball is it's pretty what much we do. everything. It's literally it what is, we do. <laughs> so I'm, this, I'm, I'm glad you actually, so this is, this is, this is my opinion. Yes. If your coaches are going to see one drill, one drill is curved running. Hmm. For your guards, for your forwards, anybody who's coming off of the screen, they should see curve run because you're going to see who's really good at it. And when you talk about from a tactical standpoint, if they're really good at curve running and they come off of a down screen, you're talking about they can curl it, they can flare back, they can wonder, like you're seeing who is the best at coming out of this. Mm. Not even just going to talk about the fact of the demands that it puts on someone's ankle and their hips. Yeah. Incredibly beneficial because it's getting into a plane of motion that they're not going to be able to hit unless they're actually playing and you can yeah. work on those mechanics. Mm -hmm. But curved running to me is another one of those low hanging fruit where like when we do linear runs, we do, we do our sled linear runs with our, with our sandbags and then mm -hmm. some, some unloaded stuff. Usually anywhere between uh, eight total, so four right leg back, four left leg back, anywhere between uh, six to ten total. But when it comes to curves running, we're going to hit at minimum eight. We're, we're going to go around eight, eight, eight to uh, 12 with full recovery just because of what it is and what it does. Um, yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing that I think a lot of people have started to realize is how much it looks like the sport without saying it's sport specific, but it's still, it's working, it's working on those types of mechanics yeah. and then mm -hmm. having creati creativity with it. So we will yes. pro progress to have to adding a jump because that mm. is literally what it looks like. If you were to go downhill, if you're going from left wing and you're crossing over yeah. to go to the right side, that's what it is. You're doing a curved run. Into a, to take a hard D cell to a hard yeah, D to a hard D cell and a takeoff. So yep. once we've gotten some decent mechanics down for um, cur uh, cover linear running, we'll add in yep. that jump. Whether it's two one, once you get into your first turn, oh, sorry one into your first turn, and then right into your second, or we'll or, or, or we'll go multiple. 
Um, yep. But I think that is a huge. I think curving cur- your running, if you're not doing that in, see, in your in your out of season program, you definitely need to add it. And that is definitely from a tactical standpoint, your coach has got to see it. Because yeah, I worked at a university, and our best player wasn't really that good at coming off of screens. Yeah. Um, and when we did curve running, maybe, you know, everyone's, oh, he's an ISO guy. But when we did curve running, he didn't look, he didn't look as good. One of our best shooters, who was a catch and shoot three guy, he was phenomenal at it because he was so used to coming off of a down screen and squaring his feet and going. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's, so it's for, for a basketball coach, it's really good to see because from a tactical standpoint, you can say, I can so and so looks really good co- coming off of that down screen. Yeah. This person needs to get better at it because again, you're giving yourself a bunch of different dimensions to to say, okay, I can come off and dribble, I can curl, I can flare. So from a tactical standpoint, from a player, it's phenomenal because you're getting better at it. Um, yeah. And I think you know that's always going to be huge when you get guys that are at that next level when they're making money doing this. I had a player who told me. When I come off a right side down screen, I don't feel comfortable squaring my feet up. So if you actually watch this guy's film, he would delay his shot. So sometimes he got it off or he would go into a straight down, downhill drive. Whereas uh-huh. the other side, he could do anything. And when you, and when you went back and watched his synergy, you saw that he shot. 15% better from one side than the other. And he took about, I think it was, I can't think off the top of my head, but he took off more shots on the left side than he did his right from three on that specific play on a down screen because he was more comfortable. Now that comes into, yes, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Linear is a way to get it dynamic, uh, um, dynamically. And then you obviously can train whether it's, you know, lateral lunges, caustic lunges. Uh, we have a what the straps. So we do a lot of kind of oh, yeah. rotational work that helps. But yep. curvilinear running is a dynamic way to really get used to getting into internal rotation in that uh, medial hip. I was just going to say that. And then also, like, the uh, kinesthetic awareness and ability to control your body when you're coming around that curve because your center of mass and center of gravity is – different obviously and so if then you can come off that whether it's a down screen whether it's a pick whatever the case may be you come off of it and then that plays into footwork right because if you're going to pull up for a jumper you got to go left right or right left and you can see it on guys literally just like you explained is like he doesn't feel comfortable going this way well when he dribble drives that is a curvilinear thing too yeah Right, like that's what people don't understand. Like a dribble drive is curvilinear. It's just not a very large bend, right? As if I'm running on top of the key. Well, when you dribble drive and then you go left, right, or you cross over or whatever, a lot of it. Just look at the angle of the body. It's still curvilinear. The path is still curvilinear, and the foot. That's why I think it's. It's. I've been getting more interested in learning about the foot on the outside edge, on the inside edge, and all this other stuff, because it's like that's literally sport. Um, but all of that action is curvilinear. All that stuff is curvilinear. And if you're not getting it or if you're not preparing for it, if you're not preparing to then go curvilinear, uh, decel, change of direction back to a curvilinear because that's what happens all the time. And then a jumper mm-hmm. or then a dribble drive or then n- another curvilinear, right? Like <laughs> if you're not preparing for that, I mean, and if you're not doing that at fast speeds, it's – um. I don't know. I, I just think you're, you could be no, missing the boat tremendously. I would have yeah. loved to see, I would love to see someone like Steph Curry or like Rip Hamilton. This, some people don't know who Rip Hamilton is. He was one mm-hmm. of the best, you know, coming off the screens, but I would love to see guys like that, like guys who are, who made a, who make a living coming off screens. I would love to see how, how they do it. And I could probably almost guarantee that they'd be the, the, like Steph Curry, you don't see him as the best at it. Right. Like you wouldn't see him as, sorry, you wouldn't see him as like the most athletic dude, but I guarantee mm-hmm. you he probably does. He, his curvilinear running mechanics are probably better than some of the most elite level athletes that he's playing against. And he's just better at it. He's able to, 
he's he's able to manage his body in a way that he can go through it. Uh, you know, I, well, I think well, that's one of the biggest things. Well, this is where we can, I think, you know, when you break sport down, when you look at it, this is where I think we can integrate the physical performance and the technical technical. Because what happens when you come off that, that down screen, that pick, or whatever the case may be, is the faster you can do that, you're creating more time right? More time means you can either get a shot off, you can dribble drive, you can have a little bit more patience, you can step back, you can do whatever you want, right? And so the faster you can get downhill, the faster you can come off that, and you have the tactical advantage due to physical preparation, you then now have so many more options in your bag, just like you alluded to earlier, which allows you to be special, right? And so it's like when people look at this, Yes, hard to guard, man. Hard to guard. You you have all these options. You have you're you're hard to guard, and you know, I don't care what level of college you play at, NAIA, three, two, one. You're all elite. Every one of them are elite level athletes. So, like we had talked off air, those the 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 smallest changes matter the most Mm -hmm. because it is a split second that you might have to get a shot off to get position like all that yes. matters so this drill specifically for guards bigs it's going to help especially the way the game is now but specifically yeah, yeah, yeah. guards one through three guys who are coming off down screens like for them it is a must it is mm-hmm. a must like we have some bigs that aren't that do it a little bit um i throw it in there because just of what it can do for the body the body mechanics the body awareness but there mm-hmm. theirs is a little different they do a lot more Side facing sprints. I think if you're a big sure. man, side facing sprints are are key because that is literally them getting into a screen, get out of the screen. That's yep. going to be huge. So there's ways to say that. Okay, my agility work can be seen as sport specific. You can sure. explain it that way. You can explain to a coach, hey, we're doing a side facing sprint with our fours and fives because you have them going into screens and sprinting out. Well, this is what we're working on. Complete dead stop, go. All right, progress, add band, add chain, add sled. However, you can pr- progress that. So yep. everything that we are trying to do is always finding a way to relay to these sport coaches. And in basketball, yep. the best way is to show this is how this is what someone does in a game. This is the drill. And it legitimately correlates. Correct. Not like and some sport specific IG post of this work and like these legitimately can translate and correlate to what you will see. You can actually make a tactical find and say, so-and-so is really good at this. Let me just see what, what, what he looks like coming off a down screen. Wow. That right. looks great. He can do all three. He's harder to guard coming off that and he gets set, uh, separation. Boom. Like you're giving tactical advice without knowing you're giving tactical okay. advice. And then you add one other layer and now you can make a decision, right? And so yeah. whatever that decision may be based upon your um, technical and tactical positioning due to hopefully some sort of physical preparation, you can now make decisions. And we know the speed of the game is dictated by the speed yeah. of the ball and, and your decision-making abilities. And so guess what? Now we've hopefully therefore helped everybody make Better decisions, yeah. faster decisions, more decisions, uh-huh. more options, and then move the ball faster or score the ball faster. Which objectively. Therefore, objectively. Objectively. Right. Objectively. Right. 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 It's, so, it's crazy how you can you can break it all down, put it all together. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, objectively. So. Man, man. Um, this, Vinny, this has been fantastic. This has been what I would consider one of the best ones that I've done for multiple for sure. reasons because of the amount of layers of – integration from a holistic standpoint you know and so i think it was it's been fantastic where can people find you online if they want to reach out to you oh uh jesus i think it's coach i think both are coach kaluti um instagram twitter linkedin is just my name i don't we've talked i am trying to put out more like content but uh i'm working on it right now you'll see my little girl she's two years old you'll you'll see her a ton but uh, I'm doing my best to put out. I've been pressured by everybody to throw some more content out there. So I, I did really good last week. I'm I'm a little slow. That I'm I'm slow this week. I haven't done anything yet. But um, those two de- yeah. uh, definitely. 
I'm not the greatest at responding to emails. I know I'm still have to get back to a couple people. Um, I haven't yeah. forgot about you, but V C A L A U T T I at smu.edu. Shoot me an email. Um, and then, you know, if, if, if we want to connect, whether it's a text or a phone number, then, then we can go through there, but not, you know, I love to talk about this stuff. Um, I do the best I can and try to make sure I respond to everybody. I will say once it turns like seven o'clock, I'm home, I'm with my little girl. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm daddy mode, but, um, yeah. you know, I'm up, you know, before the sun comes up. So whenever somebody wants to get a call, you know, if we can get something scheduled out, I'd love to, uh, I haven't forgot about the people that I haven't been able to reach back to. I will be doing it as soon as this is over, but uh, <laughs> not definitely, you know, I, I love to talk about this stuff. And then I love to learn, man. I, you know, none of us have all the answers. Uh, you might have something that might, you know, bring my whole thing together. So uh, yeah. definitely reach out. That's one thing that I, I do appreciate you that you consistently um, put out there it is, you know, you don't know what you don't know and we need to be lifelong learners. And I think a lot of times that, we struggle is that we aren't continuously learning. And so we get into this dogmatic approach of like, this is how it always needs to be this because I've always done it this way because blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, like you mentioned multiple times on like who you've learned things from, from the mouse, from the Grizzlies, from this person, from that person and how you've integrated it. And yeah, I think we're the, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna butcher this, but like the stealers of everything, but the masters of none or like the crazy mm -hmm. or something like you can learn something from everybody. Um, and, try it and if it doesn't work or you don't like it you can then you don't then you don't like it i think that's the biggest thing for young coaches yeah. uh you might actually agree with something you might actually find a thing or two that you agree with if you don't like it it should be because you learned it excuse me you learned it you didn't agree with the philosophies and that was it not you don't like the way it looks or it conflicts with what somebody said Find, learn about it, find it, figure out if it's, if any of it is, is, you know, can, can be put to use. And it, and if it ain't great, but at least you actually took the time to learn about it. Cause you might not need it now. Maybe you need it down the road. Maybe you never do, but you will never know that if you're not objective. And I think that's the biggest thing in life. We, the older we get, sometimes we can become more objective because. We don't know what we don't know. And when we're young, we're very subjective. I'm still young. But the older I get in this field, the more objective I'm looking at everything and saying, okay, is there anything here that I can learn and that I can utilize? Not, mm -hmm. it's not what I do. I've never done it. I don't want to learn about it. I have my philosophy. I have my ways. I'm sticking to it. So yeah. be objective, yeah. learn, and see what you can take from it. 100% humble yourself too because there's a lot of people out there that know way more or try more stuff yeah. or whatever the case may be and be like, hey, man, you know what? Like I learned stuff today, you know, and I'm going to go and implement that and provide and, and say, hey, do I like this? Does it work well? Does it fit well? Does it flow well? Does it – all those other things. And if so, fantastic. Let's, you know, let's keep that in. And if not, hey, you know what? I got a tool in my tool bag that I've attempted. Maybe it works. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe I need to sharpen it, whatever. But the problem is, is when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, 100%. You know, it, it, and so it's like, hey, get more tools in your toolbox. It's just like athletes get more skills in your skill set. Like it's it's not difficult, right? Um, Same thing. So, but man, I just want to let you know that I appreciate you, what you're doing, your thought process, um, where you're at with you know SMU and, and where you've been to and look forward to continuing conversations like this with you in the future. Um, and, and, and I'm just excited for y'all this year, but I just want to let you know, I appreciate you and everything that you're doing as well. And appreciate your time hopping on today, man. Same, man. Let's, let's, let's definitely do this again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So guys, here's the thing. If you learned something, just a huge favor, share the show. Okay. Full length episode is on YouTube. Um, so go subscribe to that. If you like this episode, do us a huge favor, leave a five star review because this will let other coaches know that it's worth their time. And honestly, if you don't do that after this episode, I think you're really doing us and other coaches a massive disservice. So do us a huge favor, leave a review, share the show, um, and let somebody else know about this because I guarantee this can definitely help somebody. So until then, y'all, uh, we'll catch you all on the next one.